Michael, thanks so much for joining us today. So great to be back with you, Adam. <laughs> oh, Michael, you are one of our perennially most requested guests on this channel. A lot of people are very excited that you're able to come back and join us this week. We got an awful lot to talk about. Let's just dive right in. Let's start with a question I like to ask you at the beginning of all of these discussions. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that, you know, your audience has this visceral knowledge that things are not normal. And what I'm going to try to do today is explain what that not normal feeling is, put some data behind it, and then talk a little bit more about my model. So let's just talk about the situation today. We had, without a doubt, the greatest distortion of interest rates and money supply growth in history. That, that is a fact. And I'm going to go into the data again with all of these hypotheses. That engendered a triumvirate of asset bubbles in stocks, bonds, and in real estate. The greatest bubble, all three existing concurrently in history. And again, I'm not being hyperbolic. I'm going to put data behind what I just said. And that led to, you know, when you make money free and distort asset prices and distort money supply and distort borrowing costs, that led to the most over leveraged global economy in history which of course led to record inflation, 40 year high inflation in the developed world, all existing concurrently. And if you actually count inflation accurately, it was the greatest bout with inflation in the developed world concurrently in history. And that forced central banks to undergo a course of unprecedented monetary tightening. Again, all of this is gonna be given with data and facts, not just my opinion. So then I'm going to talk about what is holding the crash in abeyance for now and what my IDEC inflation deflation the economic cycle model says about what is happening next. What's the predictive algorithm saying where we're headed in the very near future? All right, great. Well, look, um, you were on this program in 2021 warning about the greatest monetary and fiscal spending cliff in history, <laughs> which we got. <laughs> and 2022 happened and, and definitely, you know, the market sold off pretty hard that year. Um, as you said, sort of the crash is being held in abeyance right now, at least for the time being, we'll find out. Um, but I do want to give you props for having sort of, you've been tracking the story well so far. So uh, how do you want to dive into the macro story here? I got a bunch of questions for you about, you know, a lot of current topics, the debt ceiling, what's happening right now with inflation, what the Fed's likely to do next, where liquidity truly lies here, what kind of recession odds are there? How's the best way to jump into your description of where we are? So let me just go through what I just promised I would go through. Okay. So let's just talk about the, the money supply increase and interest rate manipulation, because again, this is going to tell us why we have a problem. What, what led to the crash in 22? Why is the S&P 500 still down 15%? Why is the NASDAQ still down 18%? And then we're going to talk about why it's not crashed yet and what I see happening and when that crash is going to happen. So let's, let's just take it step by step. We have about an hour, as you said. So let's slowly walk through this. This isn't, you know, <laughs> one of the things I love about Wealthy, and it's not sound bites TV, you know, it's not like, you know, we, it's not a 200 day moving average television show or how I feel uh, you know, growth versus value. This is about data and math. So let's go through them. Let's go through some numbers. So in the US, there was an $8.2 trillion increase in the base money supply from $800 billion in the start of the global financial crisis to $9 trillion in the base money supply or the Fed's balance sheet. Now, what, what is the base money supply? They call it, there's another name for that, by the way, it's called high powered money. Why do they call it that? Because it's the basis. It's it's actually notes and coins in circulation and bank credit or Fed credit, which is the building blocks of all loans in a fiat monetary system. So it's very important to understand that you go from $800 billion to $9 trillion since the global financial crisis. You, you, you create a, a tremendous amount of latent potential to build 
broader monetary aggregates and inflation. Then you had near 0% nominal borrowing costs for 10 of the last 14 years. So they were below 1%, around 0% for 10 of the last 14 years. That's the United States. But this phenomenon, by the way, Adam, was global in nature. Global central bank balance sheets were 8% of GDP prior to 2000. Well, why, why 2000? Well, that's before we, we embarked on this grand experiment with zero borrowing costs. You know, in 2000, in the crash of NASDAQ in 2000, we took interest rates to 1%. And we raised them back to five and a quarter, six percent before the collapse of the the housing bubble. Uh, and then we went to zero percent. So two, it was eight percent of GDP in the year 2000. They are now 47 percent of GDP. Wow. Central bank balance sheets. Now you talk so about from eight percent 20 years ago to 47 percent. I'm not talking about a nominal. I'm sorry. I'm just saying, I'm repeating, it went from eight percent about 20 years ago, 47% now? Of GDP. I'm not of talking GDP. about the increase in the balance sheet. I'm talking about right, the percent right, right. of the underlying economy. That should, that should just like tell you how this, when I say the greatest distortion in money supply growth, base money supply growth, high powered money in history, that's that's a fact. That That's, that's an undeniable fact. And what did all that money supply do? It engendered um, the greatest asset bubbles in, in stocks, bonds, and real estate. So let's just talk about the equity bubble, first of all. In in At the end of 2021, start of 2022, the total market cap of equities, which is the valuation of equities as a percentage of the un underlying economy, hit 200%, 200%. If you go back to the global financial crisis, which is when you know people always say, well, there's no more leverage in the economy. You know, <laughs> everything's normal. There's no great distortions out there. Banks are overcapitalized, blah, 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 except when they go out of business, uh, four of them so far. So it, before that, it was 105% before the start of the global financial crisis. So we, we doubled the total market cap of equities as a percentage of GDP. I, I'm sorry, as a percent, yeah, as a percentage of GDP. Doubled since the global financial crisis, which is before the, the global financial crisis, system melted down. Now let's talk about the bond bubble. Was there a bond bubble? I wrote a book about it in 2013 called <laughs> The Coming Bond Market Collapse. I, I mean, it was a predictive book. It wasn't supposed to happen the, 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 the day after it was published. <laughs> We've had this collapse of the of the bond market. Now, here's some pre, here's a pre, here's prima facie evidence, which I'm sure you're aware of, and I'm sure your listeners are aware of, but if they're not, I'll refresh their memory, that there was, there was almost... $18 trillion of negative yielding debt in the world. Not too long ago, like a year ago, before March of 2022. $18 trillion of negative yielding debt. Now, before 2014, the thought that you could get paid to borrow money was anathema. It was, you know, in the twilight zone. That's how, that's how much and how far interest rates were distorted. Let's talk about the real estate bubble. Switching to the real. This is the thir third leg of the triumvirate of bubbles. Home price to income ratios today are higher than they were at the peak in 2005. Mortgage servicing costs. So you look at the, the principal and interest in mortgage payments as a percentage of income are higher today than they were prior to the global financial crisis. Uh, I, and I think you had somebody named, I think his name was Gurley, G-E-R-L-Y, an excellent interview Nick Durley, on your yeah. program, which will back up the data that I just said. Those are facts that I just, those two things I just said, home price to income ratios and the mortgage servicing costs are higher today than at any other time in history. Now, those are your three, that's the triumvirate of bubbles that I called. And there are ancillary bubbles out there also. There's bubbles in autos. There's bubbles in crypto. They're gonna, those are ancillary bubbles that will burst, but those are the three biggest bubbles. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like just like I'll take a break there and I'll, before I get into the debt situation. Remember, it's it's the distortion of money supply, it's the distortion of interest rates, which engendered asset bubbles. But when you distort money supply growth and you distort 
interest rate borrowing costs to the tune where they're negative in nominal terms. That that 17, 18 trillion was not in real terms, wasn't inflation adjusted, it was in nominal terms. You get people to do what, Adam? They borrow a tremendous amount of money. And I want to go through that next, but I'm going to pause to let you in for uh, any kind of questions you might have.